Hey everyone, welcome to this week's live training class from Wells Vehicle Electronics. Today we're going to be talking about intermittent stalling concerns. For those of you who don't know, I'm joined here by Fritz. He's usually on our Spanish broadcast, but he'll be joining us from now on in English. That's right. And the same thing. Mike helps me with the Spanish. I'm going to be helping him with the English part of this now. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. So before we get into talking about our stalling concerns, we have to give away our t-shirt. This awesome t-shirt right here. So for those of you who don't know how this works, we're going to ask the question, go ahead and comment in your answer, and everybody who answers it correctly will be shipped one of these awesome t-shirts. So let's get into it. Question is, uh, Tech A says, if the check engine light is not on, there are no codes stored in the system. Technician B says, the check engine light must come on for any emissions related concerns. So who's right, Tech A? Tech B, ne uh, both, or neither. So go ahead, submit your answer, uh, A, B, C, or D. Go ahead and comment that in. If you're watching on the website, it's that little icon in the upper right corner. Click on that to comment, or if you're out on YouTube, just go to the chat box on the right side, comment in for your chance to win the awesome t-shirt. Okay. So why don't we get into the stall concerns. What are we working on today, Fritz? Well, you had that 2002 yep. uh, Mazda, tribute. Mazda Tribute yeah, with the stall concern. Yep. And uh, from experience, anytime there's a stall concern or even a noise, mm -hmm. the best thing to do is to talk to the customer. Exactly. The more feedback you get from the customer, the better it is to diagnose it. And if a customer drops off a car and just leaves you a note and you don't <laughs> find the stall or the noise, sure. don't waste your time. Sure. Call a customer and tell them to come down and do it with you because you may fix something that's not, not what they're looking could be, for. Could be. Exactly. Yeah, and it's just like, you know, that game of telephone where somebody says something to somebody and then the information changes. So the right. customer talks to your service writer or whatever, tells them it does it when this happens or that happens, and then the service writer writes on the ticket, stall. That's right. <laughs> that's usually so what happens. So you get in there, you, you take it off for a, for a ride, right. that's install, you bring it back and drop the keys in the paperwork, you said nothing happened. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So let's, uh, let's try and find some ways around that. So the best way is going to be, first of all, talk to the customer. Right. And that's what we, we did on this one. Right. Uh, as more information Mike got from the customer, mm -hmm. it got very easier to exactly. diagnose Exactly, yeah. It really helps you pinpoint where to start looking. Exactly. So when I talk to the customer with this tribute, uh, this is a three liter tribute, uh, Mazda tribute, just like an escape. Mm -hmm. um, she, she said a few things that really sparked my interest in the direction of where to go. She said, first of all, that the check engine light was on. All right. So that's, that's always a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And then also she said when she shifts it sometimes into reverse, it'll stall. Or sometimes when she's in reverse and shifts it into drive, it'll stall. All right. So <clears throat> that could be caused by a lot of things. We were probably thinking the torque converter was going into direct lockup it could be. and stalling the engine because yep. you still had the foot on the brake. Could be. So that could have been one of the things we were thinking about. Right. But then you know you brought it in, you checked the code. Yep. And the code was actually a <clears throat> P0320 code for a crank sensor problem. Okay, right. well, you know, engine moves, maybe the crank sensor is giving us intermittent issues, mm -hmm. maybe the crank sensor's failed. Yeah, the connector could be you know, the wire could be starting to touch together or it's coming, to, uh, coming apart. Yep. And as soon as you jar that engine and move that harness, it stalls the engine. It loses the signal to the PCM, be. doesn't know where it's at, right. shuts the car off. So normally, you know, if I didn't talk to the customer on this one and hear that when she's shifting it and the engine's moving, I would have started with going ahead and scoping out the crank sensor. Right. Let's make sure that the crank sensor is actually giving the signal, make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. And also, uh, by having a code, mm -hmm. sometimes when uh, you work on a vehicle and it's a little cooler and uh, you check the uh, crank sensor and, and it is working okay because it's cool, you, you assume that when it gets hot, it's breaking down and you replace it. Sure. And in this case, we wouldn't have fixed the problem. Sure, yeah. I could have put 12 crank sensors yeah. in this tribute and it wouldn't have fixed it. So what I ended up finding was, before I even bothered hooking a lab scope up, I duplicated exactly what shifting from park to reverse would do. It would mm -hmm. rack the engine. So I did the same thing. I tried to manually rock the engine while the motor mounts and everything were nice and tight. Yep. Okay. So I knew that that was okay, but I, what I noticed is that the engine harness seemed like it was moving more than it was supposed to. So with the vehicle running in park, I just started wiggling around on the harness, and as I got closer to the PCM, it stalled out on me. The yep. engine cut out, and I knew that my problem was somewhere in that wiring then. Yep. I had something similar like that to happen to yeah. me. 
especially my wife's, my wife's uh, escape. Your own vehicle. <laughs> my own vehicle. <laughs> uh, we were on vacation and the sure. transmission went out, so I put one in it and I was taking it out. There was a little wire that I didn't quite see and didn't disconnect it, so I kind of pulled it, mm -hmm. but I caught it on time. Well, two years later, my daughter's driving and she comes, Dad, the uh, torque converter's kicking in and out. And I said, are you sure? So I took it for a drive and sure enough, it was kicking in and out. Okay. So I figured it was the solenoid in the, tra in the transmission sure. or, or the torque converter clutch was starting to go out because it had a lot of miles. And uh, one night I was in bed sleeping, I remember taking the transmission out. <laughs> comes to you at night, right? Yeah. That's when all the good information so comes. So I went to that little wire and guess right. what? I pulled it and it came apart. There you go. Yeah. And that's what we actually found on this one. When I got to the PCM harness, I started separating wires and pulling on individuals or, or little packs of wiring to, to determine which wire exactly it was. Mm -hmm. And I kind of already had a thought in my head that being that I had a crank sensor code right. and I had an, a stalling concern and I tugged on a harness that it died, I kind of thought that it would be the crank sensor wire. So that helped me narrow it down to finding this gray and yellow wire here. And if we bring up a picture here, you'll see that the wire, while it's still connected and it's not um, torn at all, there's no corrosion or anything right. in there. You can actually see the color changes as it goes through this, that center part of the wire right there. That sh is typical of when the insulation actually stretches exactly. when the copper inside is broken. Exactly. So while the wire's intact still, mm -hmm. the copper inside is broken and it doesn't pass the signal through to the PCM. So the crank sensor is giving out its signal perfectly, it's traveling all the way through the wire to that broken spot and then cutting out and at that point, the computer says the engine's not running anymore, it cuts fuel and spark. Right. And it really was really odd. It was so close to the connector yeah. to the PCM. We found it hard to believe it was damaged there. So we don't know if somebody worked on it in the past and, that's and pulled go it. Going and talking with the customer again, I found out that this thing had had some work done on mm -hmm. it back by the uh, DPFE and the EGR valve. And right. what I found was one of the brackets where the, um, where the wire is routed there's a bracket right there that's supposed to have a nut on it to hold the harness in place. Right. Well, I found that nut missing, so the harness was able to flex and move more than it's supposed to, right. and over time, that breaks down the wiring. Exactly. So that's something to really, really watch for, and you know, sensors fail. We all know that sensors have their issues, and the best way to diagnose like a crank sensor would be to put a scope on it, but in this case, we could have scoped it all day long and it never would have acted exactly. up. Exactly. Um, you know, when, when uh, it's cold, the sensors only fail hot, this one would have still been working. Exactly. The, sensor, the sensor in the vehicle is just fine. Right. So, you know, if you guys do a lot of engine work or mm -hmm. engine swaps, those brackets are there for a reason. Exactly. You know, uh, especially nowadays, they moved all the PCM from the engine compartment, from the inside of the car to the engine compartment. Yep. Those wires are uh, a little shorter. They don't give that much give. So they, those brackets are there for a reason. Exactly. Put them back. Do, do the customer a favor. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. Right. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> sometimes these things are a lot harder to find. Luckily, this tribute was easy enough to mm -hmm. shake the harness and, and make it act up, and it worked right away. Well, the reason why is because you got good information from the customer. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, if you can't talk to the customer or the customer really doesn't know what's going on, you can go out to places like Identifix. It's great for typing in just a concern and coming up with issues. So that's what we did with this tribute. And as you can see here, just by typing install, it's common for coil unplugs to yep. fail, causing stall, uh, PCV hoses, creating large vacuum leaks for stalling concerns, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But really, there's not a lot of crank sensor issues on no, this. No, not on these. So by going out to Identifix, it wouldn't have really pointed us in the right direction. Fortunately, this one did set a check engine light, so that gave us a direction to go. Mm -hmm. But just because it's setting that check engine light doesn't mean it's necessarily related to that or that the computer's setting the right check engine light. And that's right. actually what we ran into with the next, um, or it's a possibility of what we could run into on the next vehicle. Um, so why don't we talk about our next case study? And we actually do have this one in the shop today. It is a 2005 Dodge Dakota 4.7 liter. And similar thing to our escape, an intermittent stall concern. But mm -hmm. this one was acting up more so when the engine got hot. Right. And what do we know about when sensors get hot? They start to break down. They start to break down, increases the resistance, and causes them to fail. So uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we go over there and walk through the, the steps we used to diagnose that. Right. And uh, we'll do some scope hooking up, because that's always useful, right? Oh, well, in this case, yeah, it was very useful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you're, um, when you're doing Spanish broadcasts and right. stuff too, they love that too. So. 
Exactly. We'll be doing this one in two weeks in yeah. Spanish. Yep. So Mike will be there with me, and uh, hopefully, since I already know how to speak English, you can learn how to speak Spanish. Yeah, hopefully I can pick up on some of this. There you go. That, that'll be nice with us working back and forth right. like this. So, all right, why don't we go over to our Dakota and uh, show you guys what we found on that one. All right, let's, let's go. go. All righty then. Great. So, okay. yeah, here's our Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, the key word here was that it was a hot intermittent stall. That's right. So, as Mark, uh, uh, Mike said, mm -hmm. Listen to your customer. Right. Uh, one thing I want to let you guys know, if you talk to the customer, he may forget something, you start working on it, you cannot find a problem, stop, call him, have yeah. him come over. This customer was very specific on how this thing happened. Exactly. It, 17 minutes after he was driving. It stalled it out. stalled out. So that means right there that it's engine's hot. Exactly. And then he pulled over. Yep. And uh, cranked it. Got us going again. Right, but the crank was a little bit different. It was uh, a longer cranking time, mm -hmm. and but then it would fire up, but it seemed like it was running a little different, like it was kind of lacking power. The engine just didn't seem quite right. Right, so we'll get to that, we'll explain it why. All right, well, first step for our diagnosis was we went out to Identifix mm -hmm. and typed in stall concern and just, just to see what would come up, see if it right. gives us a, a direction to go in. So that's what we did here, you can see we have stall entered in and we got some throttle body complaints, uh, PCM, idle air control valves, coils, vacuum hoses, transmission issues. Right. Uh, but nothing related to... Right, really nothing that would um, match his description of what was right. going on with, with the vehicle. Right, and fortunately on this one, we had a check engine light on also. Mm -hmm. So we had the P0335 code in here, right. which is referencing the crankshaft position sensor. Exactly. So just like on our Tribute, where we had a crank sensor issue, again, this one had a crank sensor issue. So we did the same thing, went out to Identifix and go ahead and search for the P0335 code, and it brought up something really, really interesting. So in our description here, in the test procedure, it says here to duplicate the problem, which is always the first step, like right. you talked about. If you can't duplicate it, don't go any further. Right. You're just ending up wasting your time. Exactly. So duplicate the problem, and then they're talking about scoping the cam and the crank sensor. Okay, well, why would we want to waste our time scoping the cam sensor if the code we're getting is for the crank sensor? Right. It, it seems like a waste to go to the cam sensor, plug it all in, hook it all up, find where it is. It seems like more work. But what they actually say here is often the problem will actually be with the opposite sensor. Uh, the cam sensor can set crank sensor codes, and the crank sensor can set cam sensor codes. That's right. And that actually caught us by surprise. Mm -hmm. But when we started talking about it, we said, well, he pulls over, he stalls out, he pulls over, mm -hmm. <clears throat> cranks it a little longer, but it does manage to start. It does start. So now that, that tells us something there. Right. And so our next step was either we go to the vehicle and hook our scope up to both sensors and see what they're doing, or we do a little bit more research and find out why this thing can set a cam sensor code for a crank sensor and vice versa. And so that's the route we took first, right. was do the research and you know, sit at the computer for 10 or 15 minutes and learn what the system is doing. And what we found was the fact that this thing uses a cam sensor that has multiple different uh, tooth patterns, different groupings. Exactly. So it can, it can determine which cylinder is which by, by looking at just the cam sensor. It doesn't need the crank sensor to run. That's you could cool. drive around with the crank sensor unplugged and it would run, it would have an extended crank time but it would still run. Exactly. But vice versa, if you are missing your cam sensor on this engine, the engine will not run. That's right. So that, that, by, that, by knowing that information, we knew that we could just forget about the cam sensor right. and focus on the current sensor itself. And like, you know, not necessarily because we got a current sensor code means it's a crank sensor. We got to check our wiring too. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so by knowing the fact that this thing stalls out but restarts, mm -hmm. we can ignore our cam sensor. Right. We can, we can go ahead and look at our crank. And like you said, we got to look at our wiring. Like on our Tribute, we had to do that wiggle test mm -hmm. and um, find that broken wire on there. So that's what we did first on, the, right. on here is we wiggled around all the harnesses and nothing happened. That's correct. And remember, when you're doing the wiggle test, you're grabbing the harness and you're just trying to move it kind of like it does on the vehicle, sometimes a little bit more, but you're not trying to pull pins out of connectors or anything. So that's correct. You don't have to jerk it around or do anything like right. that. Right, you may end up with a Tribute with the 
broken wire. You could, you could break a wire that wasn't meant to be broken exactly. or wasn't broken in the first place. So we did the wiggle test on here and it didn't do anything. Uh, we went ahead and moved on to another test and that's the tap test. But why don't we go ahead and hook up the scope first so everybody can see what it looks like. Well, and then we'll do a tap test right. from there. Should we bring our wiring diagram and show them what, where we hooked up? Sure, and let's do that. So here is the wiring diagram. And now this diagram actually gives us a ton of information. Yes, it does. More than just what color goes to what part of the connector. If we look at this, we can um, kind of cross things off our list of things to check. You know, Besides just scoping our signal, we know we have to scope our signal. It's mm -hmm. a three-wire sensor. Um, a two-wire sensor, you can't. Right. I, I mean, a two-wire sensor, you can do a different test. You can ohm a two-wire sensor, but a three-wire sensor is a, a hall effect switch. Right. So it's a digital uh, waveform. The only way to get a di digital waveform is by using your scope. Right, yeah. An ohm test wouldn't do you any we good with a three-wire. Really right. So we would go ahead and scope out our signal wire here. And we do have that set up already for you guys, and we'll show that in a minute. But pin one on both the cam and the crank is signal back to the computer. But what we can kind of determine here and what we can cross off of our list is if you look at our grounds here, both cam and crank sensor and map and throttle position and intake air temp all share this splice in common, this splice 123 that goes back to ground. Um, so we know that this splice and the path to ground must be okay because we're not having issues with any of these other sensors. What this doesn't tell us though is it doesn't tell us if our path from the sensor to the splice is okay, we could have an issue in there still. That's true. But at this point, I would be looking, moving this down my list of things to check, I guess. Um, same thing with our five volt power supply in. From our PCM here at the bottom, five volt comes up to splice number 122 and splices to our throttle position sensor. Not having any issues with throttle position, so we must know that the computer's sending the voltage and it's getting to the splice. Now there's no way to know yet if the splice to the computer, uh, excuse me, to the crank sensor is okay. That's something we could check. That's but right. again, that's something I'd probably move further down the list knowing that the rest of this is okay. Right, and by hooking up the, <coughs> the computer to the crank sensor, mm -hmm. we can actually eliminate all that because if we can get a five volt reference, we, exactly. can see, we can see a signal, then we know that all that's fine. But right. on the other hand, you know, it doesn't hurt to check and wiggle the wires. Exactly, yep. It. So if we're getting a signal out of the crank sensor, it has to have power and ground right. there. You know, a uh, three-wire sensor works with power, ground, and, and then the signal light. Right. So without one of those three, then it wouldn't function at all. That's correct. All right, well, let's, uh, let's see what it looks like. All right. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get the scope pulled up here. And we'll see up on our screen. All right, here we go. We'll see up on our screen. Let's take a look at our parameters. If you want to go ahead and bring this up. You can see our parameters right now. We're on channel two. This is hooked up to our crank sensor. We're on the 20 volt scale. And the time is set at 20 seconds right now. So I'm already thinking this is probably not gonna look very good. But let's start it up and see, see how, how it looks and how we're gonna change it. All right, you got contact. All right. So right away there, we saw our sensor go up to five volts. So that tells us we're getting power in there. And then it starts switching here. So I'm gonna change our scale now. We wanna zoom in, we'll start with voltage. Bring this down, let's go down to 10. There we go. You can see this cleaner now. Let's jump our time down now too. We'll go from 20, let's go down to, let's see what five seconds looks like. That's still pretty messy. Let's go down to one. Starting to look better. Let's try 200, 100 milliseconds. I like that right there. That looks nice. So we're on a 10 volt scale, 100 milliseconds. This is our crankshaft position sensor signal. And uh, Fritz, what do you think of this signal? Well, it looks pretty good. I think that looks normal. Yeah. And we verified that against uh, diagrams we found out on IATN, and this is what a normal crank sensor looks like. That's correct. So why don't we add the cam sensor in there now? Go ahead, turn on our channel one and adjust our voltage just like we did for the crank sensor. And there we go. It's kind of buried underneath there, so let's bring our flag up to, so we can see it easier. Let's bring this one down a little. Okay, there we go. All right, why don't you go ahead and shut this thing off okay. and we can talk about this, this graph mm -hmm. a little bit here. So what we have 
And what we talked about before was the fact that the cam sensor on here is able to tell the computer where, where the engine is. So if we look, you can see we're getting two triggers, three triggers, two triggers, two triggers, and this is all completely normal. There's a pattern inside of here that is running three triggers, one, one, two, two. So the computer knows this pattern, and this pattern repeats constantly. By the computer knowing this pattern, it's able to know what cylinders where and, and right. how to time the fuel and the spark. And the reason why it takes it takes a extended crank, right. it needs to see it more than two two or three times sure. in order to figure out that the crank's offline. Exactly. And then she'll know when to pick up number one cylinder and when to start firing the injectors in order to start the vehicle up. Right. So by having that cam sensor in there, it's got nothing to compare the cam sensor to. Right. So it needs to see multiple cycles of it, where normally when the cam and the crank are meshed up together, it will pick up a signal right away with the cam and the crank and fire the with engine the right one, away. With a half a revolution to one revolution, exactly. you pick it up. Exactly. exactly. So now when, we, when this thing was failing, he said it would crank for about three or four seconds total mm -hmm. and then fire up. So to me, that sounds like, and judging by what we know now in the system, that our crank sensor on this engine is most likely just to help fine tune things and make things run better with, with more, more uh, power, better ignition timing, exactly. and then also to monitor the misfires. Mm -hmm but the engine doesn't really need the crank sensor to run. Not in this vehicle. Not in this vehicle. Some, <laughs> that's all it takes is that's a crank right. sensor to be uh, yeah, intermittent right. or unplugged and the thing dies and never restarts. That's right. So, very interesting. And, and actually, this is kind of like, um, remember we were talking about that GM crank sensor where it is using two? That's right. That's kind of what they've done here with the cam and the crank sensor. It's a very similar setup where if one of the sensors, the crank sensor goes bad, it can still run off of the other one. That's correct. So. Interesting stuff. So why don't we try and make this thing fail now and right. see, see what we can do. So remember this, this thing was failing when the engine was hot. So we do have the engine warm already. Um, so let's go back to our live diagram here and go ahead and fire it up, Fritz. Okay, so right now everything's working normal. But what I got here is a screwdriver in my hand and what we're gonna do is do a tap test. And that tap test has been around for a long time, right? Oh yeah, Glenn and I were just talking about it. Glenn and I are kind of old timers. <laughs> and back in the 80s, beginning of the 80s, when they started having more electronic map sensors and uh, components that would fail because mm -hmm. the soldering would fail due to the heat. And vibration. Uh, and vibration. Yep. I remember my brother had a 1985 Buick Regal. He came home and said, hey, my car's running really bad. Especially when we go over bumps, it seems to stutter a little bit. Sure. So I opened the hood, I reached over and I tapped on the map, mass airflow and I stalled it. Sure. So it not only necessarily has to be a cam or crank, it could be a PCM, a module, anything that has the controls electronic yeah. s uh, signals. If it's got some problem, if you tap it, it will fail. Any because sort of intermittent problem. Right. You know? if, or, or say the problem's already um, occurring, it's already failed, sometimes you can tap it and you can get it to work again. Right. You know, so. like with a starter, you tap on a starter, it starts working go. again for, for that time. You know? That's a good example. You get a starter that gets stuck, you right. get somebody under there, start wrapping it with the hammer. Right. And I'm not saying use the hammer on a PCM or a module, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> a, the plastic end of right, a screwdriver exactly. works really well. Just like Mike is going to show you right now. Right. Yeah, the goal is to just tap it right. and kind of give it a vibration effect similar to like when a customer would complain going over railroad tracks right. or potholes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to you want to shock the sensor a little bit, but you don't want to break it off. That's right. So you ready to do that? Let's I'll do get it. Back over there. Okay. okay. So I'm going to go over here. A crank sensor in this one is right underneath the exhaust manifold uh, behind this control arm right here. If you want to bring up that that shot here, you'll see I've got the screwdriver right here, and I'm going right behind our control arm here, back to this sensor. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lightly start tapping it and see if we run into any. There we go. So we just stalled out. Go ahead, fire it up again. So we still have a crank signal, okay. I'm gonna tap it again. Oh, almost stalled. There we go. All right, now she's stalled again. Let's, let's fire it up again. What I'd like to see here is get this thing to fail completely and show you guys how it fires up without a crank sensor. All right, go again. All right, 
and again. All right, so it doesn't look like it's gonna play nice. Let's just let it sit running for a minute here and uh, see if we can't get it to stall out on its own. Um, so while it's doing this, why don't we see who answered the question correctly? Now remember, the question was, if the check engine light is not on, there's no code stored in the system. And if the, the check engine light must come on for any sort of emissions related concerns. So let's see what we got here for answers. <clears throat> oh, we got a bunch. All right, we'll start out on the website. It looks like Terry came on, said Tech B. Well, we'll start with this. Terry, you are correct. The answer is Tech B. Anytime that the engine is running at a lower emission state, um, if, it's, if it's giving off emissions greater than what it was designed to, the check engine light has to come on. Right. That's the point of the check engine light. Um, it was mandated by the government to come on right. when the emissions were uh, tailpipe emissions were increased. That's correct. So technician B is correct. Technician A, if the check engine light is not on, there are no codes, that's incorrect. The check engine light does not need to be on for there to be PCM codes. Exactly, especially transmission codes. Right. Or um, what other ones besides there that There was one? that older Nissan that used to set knock sensor codes yeah, and never set a light code. on. Exactly, so if you, have a, if you have a vehicle that you, you haven't seen at the shop, it's got your engine light. Run a sure. full spectrum of codes. Right. Go through the whole Across history. All the exactly. Do all the modules. It might give you a better idea of what the car has actually been through, right. and uh, it may help you diagnose it a lot easier. Sure. Because you'll know what's been hasn't been done, or you know, True. or the, where the car's is having troubles. Sure. Or you know, maybe you have a PCM issue that's yeah. storing codes in the BCM, saying the BCM could be saying that the PCM is having issues, you know, right. that kind of thing. So it's always good to check all your modules. That's correct. So let's see who else got it right. Uh, looks like Terry here. Terry, you got it right. Uh, Henry says Tech A. Sorry, Henry, that's incorrect. Todd and Jeff both also said Tech B. All right, great, guys. Uh, let's go over onto YouTube now and take a look. Uh, Neil came on. Neil said Tech D, or excuse me, neither. Uh, sorry, Neil, that's incorrect. Uh, Nevaeh Thompson says C both. Um, sorry, again, incorrect. Hayward's Automotive, he says Tech B, that is correct. Uh, Kevin says, sorry, he misread Tech B, so he corrected his answer, awesome. Okay. Jim says Tech D, and Felix started by saying both and corrected again to Tech B. So awesome job, guys, for those of you that got it right. Go ahead and send me out an email. We're gonna bring bring up my email address here with your t-shirt size and your mailing address in it. And we'll go ahead and send you out one of these awesome t-shirts as soon as we can. Yep. So awesome. Let's uh, just make sure nobody else commented in here while I wasn't looking. Great, okay, let's see if we can get this thing to stall out once right, more, before, more we, uh, before we go. So I'm gonna come back down here again. If you wanna bring up that shot and let's see what we get here. Here we go. All right, it's stalled out. Go ahead. So we still have a signal. All right, go ahead. Now, I would love to be able to unplug this sensor right now, but it sits directly underneath our exhaust manifold, and I don't like getting burns on my hands. All right, go again. Oh, there we go. There we go, we have no crank signal at all. Oh, it just came back. <laughs> Oh man, let's try it once more. Are we gonna leave it dead? Okay, go ahead. All right. All right, well, we did see that it was trying to start without the crank signal. If we would have cranked it for about one more second, it would have fired up with that crank signal line being stuck at that five volts. Yep. Yeah, what Mike was trying to do is get the signal not to come on. Right. <clears throat> and I should have stopped turning it and then <laughs> turn it so you can tap it. And sure. we, were, we were trying to show you guys this. If you tap it with the signal dead, by tapping it, we could get it to come back on and start the right. vehicle. And so, you know, just like the starter, if it's not acting up, uh, if, if it's dead at that moment, you can tap it and make it come back and, and vice versa. Sometimes yeah. it works either way. Even a fuel pump. Sure. Get a nice big hammer, you tap that <laughs> fuel pump, you'll get it going. Sure, exactly. <laughs> Well, all right, so I guess, you know, 
watch your signals and see yep. what you got coming out and yeah, this, intermittent things are hard to right. find listen to your customer exactly and like we said before if you do what your customer said and mm -hmm. you don't get no results don't waste your time call him up tell him you need to come down go with him yeah because i uh, when he's test driving it with you he was oh by the way i forgot to say <laughs> this and it'll right. make your life a lot easier sure yeah they know what's best for right. or they know their vehicle the best that's right so, so okay anything else that's it all right so a little bit of change of schedule here guys uh, our next broadcast, normally it would be in two weeks. We're actually changing to a new format. Our next broadcast is not going to be until September 1st. So you won't get to see us again, sadly, until September 1st. Um, the new, new schedule will be the first Thursday of every month. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing the English broadcast. So right. like always, first Thursday. And then the Spanish broadcast, for those of you who watch English and Spanish, uh, the Spanish broadcast will be the third Wednesday of every month. So. Uh, just a different week, but still on Wednesdays for you guys in Spanish. That's so correct. just changing it up a little bit. And uh, all right, I think that's about it. The only thing is, Mark's closing. We figured oh, that was... Oh, yeah, uh, right, exactly. Mark said it the best when he said, uh, you know, um, without you guys being there, we would not be here. So thank you, and we'll see you again next time in the Wells Tech Garage. Have a good one, guys.